This is Sonia Wagner representing PCA families in one of our recordings that capture lived experience and best practice research-based learning that assists kinship, permanent and adoptive parents and carers in supporting young people. PCA families has a zero tolerance of child abuse. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past and present and express our intention to move together to a place of justice and partnership. Today, we are discussing adoption with Lane Beachley. Lane needs very little introduction in my view, as everyone knows she is one of the most successful surfers, male or female, in history with seven world titles and 29 tour victories. Further to that, she is simply one of the most genuinely, unapologetically honest people around with an experience of a traumatic childhood that has not defined her, but perhaps shaped her. Welcome, Lane. Thank you, Sonia. That is very true. It has not defined me, but it has certainly shaped me. <laughs> so yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, you know, perhaps some of your um, background with growing up and family life or highs or lows, your achievements, anything really. <laughs> That'll take up the whole hour that we've got together. So <laughs> can I cannot just lead people to go buy my book? <laughs> oh, yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Beneath the waves, there you go. Beneath the um, waves. Yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> but uh, to shortcut it, yeah, I was adopted into a beach-loving family with the last name Beachley and became a world champion surfer. Ta-da! There we brilliant, go. isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> Even um, your first name. You're yeah. in the beach lane, right? So. Yeah. Life in the fast lane. Yeah. And uh, look, um, how do I explain my childhood? I, I find my childhood to be very filled with fun and adventure um a bit of fair share of trauma having yep. lost my mother when i was six having been told i was adopted when i was eight yes and that's the moment that really shaped me that's the moment where i've started to subscribe to this story that i'm worthless and that i don't belong anywhere and that the only way that i can prove that i'm worthy of love and that i belong somewhere is if i become the best in the world at something Absolutely. so when i was 14 i decided to become a world champion surfer much to my school teachers uh, disappointment <laughs> why was that well because I was very I was very studious I was I was uh, really good at science maths and English okay and geography and then yes. year 10 I started to well year 9 I started to dabble in competition came dead last in the first events I competed in and that <laughs> inspired me a little bit so then I decided to keep working at it and then in year 10 I won my first regional event and then won the state events and then went to the national events and then I thought I really like this I really like this, <laughs> this winning feeling yeah this winning <laughs> feeling this winning this losing but just surfing I just yes. love this yes. so I started uh I started um what's the word, distancing myself from my studies and focusing my attention elsewhere. And yes. uh, my year 11 report card literally said, because I failed halfway through year 11, yes. it said, lock up Lane Surfboard. It's a distraction from her studies. <laughs> it will amount to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness you didn't listen to that one. So. <laughs> yeah. You won't be the only one that's had uh, something incorrect perhaps written on the school report, <laughs> on the school report right. and you know my heart goes out to everyone doing their hsc because there's so much pressure put on their people's shoulders these young adult shoulders to be really clear about where they're going and what they're going to do and how they're going to change the world and mm -hmm. very few people actually have that capacity mm -hmm. to be able to define that at such a young age there's still people in their 50s and 60s that don't know oh, what they want to do and how they want to live their lives absolutely so. and people move okay. around all the time too too, don't they so yeah. it's yeah. not just about choosing one central theme or thing so yeah um Life so theme. school for you was obviously kind of pretty cruisy depending well, on where you kind of put your time so it wasn't cruisy but it was certainly a at best a backup plan yeah whereas a lot of um children that we hear about are having challenges at school so that wasn't the experience for you so no, because i really focused the majority of my attention in my life outside of school so i yes. had a couple of girlfriends at school that i relied on very heavily for my social interaction my friendship base that's that moral support and mentoring throughout the school that we all need you know we all yes. need those connections yes that community but i also had a much bigger broader and uh fun and enjoyable community outside of school and so yes. that really helped me maintain perspective and balance in my life so much so to that today and even while i was winning world titles the majority mm -hmm. of my friendship group didn't surf okay 
So yes. I had this really good balance in life where I, it just wasn't all one thing. Even though I prescribe the word focus as the world's best acronym, which is follow one course until successful. But okay. that's when you're on that course. And when yes. you're not, so when I'm not competing, I get away from surfing and I do something else. You know, I go to the bush or I go snowboarding. Or I hang out with friends that don't surf. So mm -hmm. maintaining that equilibrium in life is, is always a challenge. Okay. So do you yeah. think, you know, obviously you had that really clear goal on what you wanted to work towards and that sort of helped you stay grounded or helped you keep moving towards something. Do you think that's important for every adoptee to find or do you think it's about what you mentioned there, that it's actually about having all those groups to go to so that you are well balanced in some ways or maybe it's both? I think yeah. <laughs> it's really important for every individual to find. It's got nothing to do whether you're adopted or not. It's actually having that what I refer to as my sustained success model. So having a really clearly articulated vision for yourself, because mm -hmm. as young adults, we are so easily persuaded. There's, you know, the peer group, peer group pressure. We want to belong. We want to connect. And to do that, we feel like we have to fit in. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that I was so focused and so driven to succeed in the sport of surfing that anything that conflicted with that I saw as nothing but a distraction and I just pushed away whether okay. it was drugs whether it was drinking whether it was partying late nights um you know anything that was a, even boys you know they were distractions yes. from my surfing and, yes and so it gave me a really clear set of boundaries that I placed okay. on myself. But that was yeah. because I was very fortunate that I had a very clear vision. So I feel that it's the clarity of vision, knowing where we're going mm -hmm. and knowing why we're going there mm. gives us the power to then choose. Yes. And then the second part of the model is making sure that you have a dream team of people around you that mm -hmm. elevate you and nurture that in you. Because yes. we're not all born world champions, not me, I wasn't. Yes. Uh, and I wasn't born with the ability to be one, but I had a dream team around me all the time. And that's not to say I didn't also encounter my fair share of dream thieves. Yes. But <laughs> Plenty of my school teachers, dream thieves. Yes. Some yes. of my peers at school, dream thieves. My peers on tour, dream thieves. Some of the guys at Manly, dream thieves, surrounded by them. <laughs> I like that concept. So, <laughs> um, so you've also reflected on winning and how it never satisfied you. So you just kind of kept raising that bar. And um, I, I've heard you also talk about that was a way to avoid rejection as well. So... Uh, and that you had some sabotage relationships and, you know, you found it hard to find empathy or compassion for yourself. So uh, I think you also said that one of your world titles you actually uh, achieved out of, I, I guess, a love mindset as opposed to a, a fear mindset. So Two of them. Yeah, or two of them. Yeah. yeah. So I've, won, <laughs> I've won seven world titles. I've won six of them consecutively, but I, I won five in a state of fear and two in a state of love. Okay. The, the right. difference between the two is, and, and number one and number seven, the, so the bookends of my competitive career were in love. <laughs> Everything yes. in the middle was nothing but fear. Right. And oh, wow. The fear-based mentality is the adoptee mentality, the fear of rejection, the fear of abandonment, the, the fear of disconnection, the fear of looking stupid, the fear of not being enough. And I don't yes. know if you can see on my T-shirt. I actually have a T-shirt that says oh. Awesome. <laughs> As a daily reminder of what's going on in my mind. Is that one of your t-shirts or just no. one you found? Wow, no. that's uh, great. <laughs> yeah. um, so we all need triggers. We all need reminders, no matter how grounded or present or aware we are. So, you know, sometimes the stories we subscribe to just take us off track and we need to find uh, circuit breakers to bring us back into the moment. So mm -hmm. wearing t-shirts like this is one of my circuit breakers. <laughs> It's five, those two world titles, um, I mean, those five world titles in the fear-based mentality was essentially win at all costs. Okay. And so that was sabotage mode. That was operating out of fear. And as an adoptee, there's a, there seems to be a, a very continuous theme or, or uh, constant theme that runs through us all, and that's this fear of rejection, this fear of abandonment. And the way yeah. that it shows up in my life is that if I'm pushing people away, Mm -hmm. I'm operating out of fear of mm -hmm. rejection. So I like to push okay. people away before I can be rejected. Yes. If I'm behaving in a way that I know is not congruent with who I truly am, mm -hmm. but it's, I'm operating out of fear again because now I'm behaving in a way that's giving people reason to reject me. Yes. Those, those two styles of behavior are literally 
their validation points, their, okay. their confirmation bias, right? So mm-hmm. I know that if I behave this way, I'm going to get pushed away. And then I get pushed away like, see, told you so. Yes. I'm- yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have to challenge our own confirmation biases because over time they become anchors. Yes. And when we anchor ourselves in these belief patterns, they end up becoming self-serving, self-propagating, mm-hmm. and we become these self-fulfilling prophecies over time. Yes. And then wonder why our lives have turned to crap and no <laughs> one around us and no yes. one really wants to reach out and support us and love us. It's because we've spent all of our time pushing everyone away to Way. protect ourselves. Yes, yes, that makes sense. And I think that's what I was referring to earlier, while a lot of children have trouble in school because yeah. they go, oh, we're going to do a maths class today. Yeah, I'm no good at maths, so I'm just going to kind of play up over here. Yeah, <laughs> And absolutely. the teacher will let me out, let me go and see the principal and I'll feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think and it- that's, that's what we do in life. You know, if we, if we find ourselves in a, in a state of discomfort, mm. we've never been taught how to embrace discomfort. Yes. And yes. a state of acceptance ends all suffering. Yes. If we can accept that we're uncomfortable, then we empower ourselves to do something about it. But if our immediate response or reaction, actually, because we stopped responding years ago when we stopped owning the emotion, our reaction to discomfort is playing up and being a fool and being the class clown to make people laugh and detract everyone's attention away from the fact that we feel stupid or that we we don't think we're smart enough. Yes. Then that's going to become a consistent theme throughout our whole lives. Yes, absolutely. And unfortunately our education system fails us in that way because we're basically told that if you've got the answer, put your hand up. Yes, correct. True. <laughs> and if you don't True. have the answer, just stay, sit back, be quiet and, and learn. Yeah, correct. Because actually, shouldn't we be encouraging curiosity? Absolutely. Now, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand. What are you talking about? Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're so right. So, and because you're in a, a classroom of 25 or 30 people, so it's hard for people to put their hand up in that environment. And particularly if you've got these kind of issues sitting in the background on top of it. So, yeah. So you, you're on a mission to change schooling? No. It's, <laughs> no. That's, no. A, that's a really big challenge that someone. Else I guess has. for parents, I guess talking to their children about what feelings they're having you know, and, and trying to explore that so they can flesh it out and be more aware of when they're pushing people away. Is there anything else you would recommend that parents could be doing with their children to help move through that rejection? And Well, parents need to learn how to honour their own feelings because if they can't sit in their feelings, they can't sit mm. in their kids' feelings. So, and that's right. where we have a bit of a disconnect. Yes. So if we can teach adults to honour their feelings and honour uh, uh, everything that comes with that, then they'll have the courage and the vulnerability to then go and sit with their children and and then they'll also create the safety for their children to do that. Yes. I never had the safety to do that with my family, so mm-hmm. I had to find friends to do that with. Right. But I also recognised at a young age the importance of owning my feelings, otherwise I was a lay blamer and, uh, and mm-hmm. re- reacted out and, you know, became the class clown and, you know, did all the things that sabotaged my <laughs> happiness and my education. So yes, what yes. I am doing with my own online education platform called Awake mm-hmm. Academy is helping people own their truth. Okay. Through starting with understanding their relationship with a variety of different emotions. Okay. And how they articulate it, how they connect with it, because we can't move past what we can't see. We can't, mm. we can't shift an emotion until we actually feel the emotion. Otherwise, mm-hmm. if we want to be happy all the time, we literally manufacture events around us to make us feel happy. We're in deep inside. We're very unhappy. Yes. So for us to transcend the unhappiness, we actually have to honour it and, and give ourselves permission to feel unhappy. Right. Yes. Okay. And really the same good. to do that. Yeah, and another, right. thing, another thing that I've noticed too with, with parents mm-hmm. is that dads love to fix things because dads don't like to feel uncomfortable. Of course, dads, yes. So they're the first to come in and fix. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and mums are very quick to come in and tell. Okay, yes, fix and tell. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah, so it's yeah. a matter of um, 
poking a hole through your own biases and through your own reactions to the, yes. to the discomfort of your children and allow your kids to move through their own discomfort at their own pace, at their own time, through their own processes and systems, not through yours. Mm. Just because it worked for you back in 1975 <laughs> doesn't mean it's going to work for your child in 2021. Correct. And it's much more time consuming and much harder to yeah. sit with and, and wait for that process to work its way through but yeah the rewards at the end are huge right well, so it actually shortcuts the long-term struggle true yes it's a yes. Yes, it is a longer process in the short term mm -hmm. but it it actually hijacks the self-sabotaging behaviors that we adopt in our 20s and 30s and 40s yeah good point so Really good point. Mm. So um, there are things like, you know, some of the things you're talking about, like compassionate parenting and strong connection and playful parenting and and other things that work really well. Um, mm. I think physical exercise was probably something that worked <laughs> yep. really well for you. Is there anything else that you look back at and go, you know, that's what worked for me or you saw it in other families? Um, yeah, I just wonder about reflecting back. Yeah, the words that keep coming to mind for me, especially as an adoptee, is safety. Okay. I always felt the need to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that I have uh, walls around my home and therefore walls around my heart. It's more <laughs> about having the safety to fail, mm -hmm. having the safety to make mistakes and not being berated or cast a, as an outcast or as being dragged across hot coals for it. Okay having the safety to not know the answers um, yes. and being encouraged to ask questions, yes. which our education system does not encourage. Having the safety to define who I am and explore the world and have a sense of independence and freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate that I grew up at a time when there was no mobile phones and no social yes. media. So yes. I had a lot of safety. Yes. Um, and if if people are listening to this and they don't feel safe on social media, then get off. Yeah. The world's going to keep spinning without you on there. Yes. <laughs> and people who you are friends with, you're still going to be friends with. We'll still be friends with, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Just do what makes you feel good that's legal. Yes. Um, <laughs> and if something makes you uncomfortable, then sit with it and ask yourself, why am I uncomfortable? in this mm. place before mm. you blame everybody else for making you feel a certain way you actually chose to feel that way mm. and i wish i had this understanding in my teens and yes. essentially i probably did because i was very conscious of who i spent my time with yes um, and i always surrounded myself with people who were older than me because i felt safer with them yes, I knew yes. That they'd look out for me they would give me a hard time but through a loving lens yes yes and, and are you interestingly, because you did put yourself in some not so safe situations as well, didn't you? So, so it's interesting to contrast that felt safety with safety. So yes, and look, I'm I'm not saying that I always felt safe. Like you said, yes, I I uh, proactively and <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I uh, voluntarily put myself <laughs> into an environment that was unsafe, such as riding really big waves and, and competing around the world and traveling to places where I'd never been before and figuring it out as I go and missing planes in Brazil and sleeping on couches <laughs> in England and being picked up by strangers when I was hitchhiking. And, you know, <laughs> wow. But as long as I trusted my own instincts and my own intuition, because it's when I haven't trusted it, that's when I've made the biggest mistakes in my life. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Trust your instincts. I think it's a good yeah. one. And we and tend did, to stray did, away did you... from them too when we when we feel unsafe. We tend to stray away from our own instincts when we feel like we have to fit in or belong. And then yes. we then we yeah, it takes that. courage to follow your instincts. So mm. I followed mine once on the top of a, a mountain at Mount Buller. So I get my flow from snow skiing. Ah. Um, and I had a whole lot of younger kids with me. I was probably 15 or 16, but I had, you know, the whole crew of all the younger children of all the families we were staying with and just got this feeling and I just said oh, look I just don't want to go down here I've never said that in my life before and I've never said it again since and then the lift stopped within two minutes so and I would have had to have dragged all those young children up that, <laughs> that hill so I was very happy to have followed my gut instinct so I think it's hard to follow though you need to have courage well it's not only courage it's also silence Ah. 
if we are stuck in our own thoughts and stuck in the world that's always spinning, then we actually don't even tune into it. That's a good point. Does yes. It? Yeah, it's a good point. So is that what you get out in the ocean, that sort of silence and, yeah. 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 So you uh, mentioned somewhere that the ocean keeps you alive. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what it you mean. My, well, it's my life force and my liquid Valium at the same time. It keeps, yes. me, <laughs> keeps life in perspective. It keeps me well balanced keeps me very happy and centered and connected. It's a place where I truly feel free. Yes. And I love, you know, running to it when I feel sad or running to it when I'm excited. It's yes. just, it's where I heal my hurts. It's yes. where I process my pain. It's where I celebrate my joys and happiness. It's, yes. It's that one place where I feel truly connected, centered, confident. Yeah. So do you still surf every day? Every day. Yeah. Wow on you <laughs> and was there anything else that helped you um unravel some of those issues was there any kind of therapy that you had or anything else that you did i'm still unraveling <laughs> <laughs> we all are <laughs> yeah. uh, look i've done a variety of different therapies and today uh you know i'm as in you know, my late 40s and actually throughout my late 30s and into my late 40s for the last decade i've been going through uh, net which is neuro-emotional technique to help mm -hmm. me disconnect from some of the things that trigger me mm -hmm. um, and just get to the fundamental basis or get to the, you know, the original event that this particular thing happened and how that triggers me into my late forties. And that happened yes. in my, you know, you show me the woman, I'll show you the child. You know? Yes. So yes. I go always reflecting back into my childhood and wondering what is it that that moment, why did that trigger this behavior? Yes. Oh, that, that's the story that I have associated with. Right. Uh, another thing that I do is rebirthing. I do a breathe every once in a while just to transmute all of the stuck energy in my body and just release it. Because um, okay. as opposed to always having to think about it and talk about it and, you know, go into it because yes. the body keeps the score, the body stores the emotion. Yes. I can actually process the emotion without actually having to go through all of the thoughts that are associated with it. Great. And, and at the time it can be quite painful and it can be quite confronting because my hands get all, you know, like this and my body's like, and I'm yes. hyperventilating. But as I continue to breathe into it and breathe deeper into it, it's like I, I'm surrendering to it and then it releases. Okay. Free of another layer of stuff. Wow. And is that a technique you've picked up from a specialist or, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, my naturopath um, does it and um, I'm interested in starting to teach it myself. Because, yes, uh, absolutely. That's essentially what it was the rebirthing technique I did back in 1997 that shone a light on my fear of rejection due to okay. my abandonment or my okay. adoption. <laughs> I yeah. wasn't abandoned. So that goes back to your comment on silence, right? So having that time to breathe and and I guess think in silence perhaps so Let's actually sit in silence sit in and, silence and tap into the wisdom of our own sweet hearts mm -hmm. because we we believe that we have to figure everything out whereas figuring everything out is the opposite of feeling through everything yeah good point so if we can just get out of our own heads for just a moment which is why surfing is such a beautiful thing for me to do because it gets me out of my head gets me back in connection with my body and my heart yes but so is meditation i meditate every day i do yoga every day I do something every day that helps me just sit and be quiet for just yes. one moment. Yes. And by doing that, I'm giving myself clarity and permission to detach from the fear-based story and change the story to something more positive or at least self-serving and less self-sabotaging. Yeah, great. Brilliant. And did reconnecting with birth family help in any way in your life journey and, and what you've processed? Yeah, it did actually. I mean, we all want to know where we come from. We all want to know why we're the way we are. And I'm so different to my adopted family. You know, they're all quite tall. They've got pasty white skin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dark olive skin. I'm five foot five. I've got bright blue eyes. I'm just, I look very different to my family, but okay. I also behave very different to my family. And yes, getting an understanding of what were the life events or the genetic traits of my family biological family that are that are entwined and connected to me now so meeting my mother was literally like looking in the mirror in 17 years time wow uh, there was no question that she was my mother and then get and then there was times when we did connect or you know i went and stayed with her for a week and because she lived in america mm -hmm. and uh and just observing her and watching i'm like oh that's where i get that from oh okay you know <laughs> <laughs> so it gave me some understanding as to why I am the way I am. But you know what? We really don't 
require necessarily external validation to connect with who we intrinsically are because mm. we are who we are and what we are and we get to choose that and the programs that we are that we're pro or the, we're subscribing to are reprogrammable um, yes it's a matter of actually just owning who you are and where you are and recognizing that if you have this fear of abandonment fear of rejection fear of worthlessness and love then what you would fear you attract and mm -hmm. what we focus on expands and i focused on that for way too long before i then to i then allowed love mm. in my life and it wasn't until i recognized that that behavior was fueling me for so long and look i'm here to tell you i was very successful with that mentality yes <laughs> oh for sure <laughs> But at what cost? Yes, <laughs> correct. Yes. So when I have that realization and that awakening, went, wow, uh, the way I'm behaving is not congruent with who I am or how I want to show up, and I've just destroyed relationships and cost my sponsorships, and you know, yes. I'm not going to be famous for the things I really want to be remembered for. So it's time to yes. change. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I guess the thing that I've been learning from experts in the adoption arena of late is that uh, adoptees like yourself tend to choose really good life partners. So <laughs> they tend to try and, you know, sort of make sure they've got someone that's going to parent in really good ways and that's going to be there for them 100% of the time. So um, so I suspect your your relationship is like that too, that you've found that kind of real strong felt safety in that relationship as opposed to just, you know, being free from harm, I, I guess. So um, is that something that resonates for you? Well, look, I'm, yes, I'm very fortunate. I've chosen well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was set up on a blind date with a rock star who does love me and yes. adores me and is so supportive and so encouraging. But you know what? There's moments where I don't feel like he's there for me 100% of the time. I mean, that's kind of unrealistic. But then deep down, I know he is. But then he's triggered by things that I do that piss him off. And that <laughs> he's got to have the comfort uh, um and the place to be able to express his frustrations and annoyances mm -hmm. and criticisms and judgments and guilts and all those things, you know, we all mm. have them. Yep. So establishing the, the parameters around how we do that is a very, that's a forever evolving. Yeah. <laughs> that's called marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and marriage in lockdown is often different to marriage <laughs> out of lockdown too. Uh, marriage in lockdown has become better. Um, oh, good. That's, oh, that's great. We spent the first seven, five, five or six years of our relationship apart. So yeah, good point. Together as we've gotten older. Yes. Um, but you know what? If I'm honest, yeah, deep down, I know he's always there for me, irrespective of the way I behave. So I mm. do feel very embraced. I mean, yes. the safest place that I know that I always retreat back to is in his arms. And that's, oh, wow. That's the safest place I feel. Yeah. I'm very that's gorgeous. That. Yeah. <laughs> that's the kind of relationship everyone should have. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess just to sum it all up, you've experienced trauma, but you're really a real lover of life and you're a powerhouse of a woman for change in the, the surfing world and beyond. Um, you're really a pioneer for women um, and equality. And so I wonder. Why you? <laughs> Why not someone else? And how do I tap into that? <laughs> <laughs> if I could bottle it and sell it, I'd yes, please. It. <laughs> um, I, it comes down to your intrinsic motivation, and and you're doing it in your way by hosting podcasts like this. I mean, yeah. if we're contributing to society, if we're contributing to the world then we are fulfilling our purpose. And it doesn't matter how you're doing it as long as you're doing it. But if you're mm -hmm. waking up every day thinking about what can I do for myself, mm -hmm. then you lose that sense of connection with a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. And then you lose the connection with that intrinsic motivation and then you revert to extrinsic motivation. Mm. And that is, look, a lot of people go through life like that and that's okay. Yes. Uh, and I was, I was probably misread to being that kind of person. Yes. Especially when I was competing because yes. I always had a greater vision for myself in the tour 
than just showing up and winning world titles. Of course, the adoptee mentality, that desire to be worthy of love, drove me to become a six times world champion. But during that and on that journey and that pathway, I was deeply invested in changing the landscape of women's service, yes. changing how it was perceived, the value it had, uh, the opportunities for women, creating more equality, more opportunity. So I was deeply invested in that. And that's why I sat on the board of directors for 15 of the 19 years I was on tour because wow, I wanted to make that it long. Up. Wow. And so every day when I wake up, I think about what can I learn today that's again going to help shortcut the struggle in other people? Mm. How can I be better today? And by doing that, I can help someone else be better tomorrow. Okay. So yes. I'm always, yeah, my attention's always focused on the greater good. And, yes. I, and that it's anchored in my own self-worth you know? yes for which me, i think is really it's really good for us to hear that so because your yeah. focus first is how can i better myself and that will better other people and i think yes. that really relates also i guess when we are trying to get carers to go and take some time for themselves so they can actually get a bit of a rest and a time out um, it's necessary otherwise yes. you can out. i mean i had to care for my dad for a whole week and i had resentment by the end of that week <laughs> do this 24 yes. 7 and not get resentful and not get bitter and guilty and twisted and yes. angry and like you just you actually that's okay yes <laughs> so what are you gonna do about it like are you yes. gonna stay angry bitter and twist or are you actually gonna go out and do something for yourself yes and you start by doing this yeah. write down a list of all the things that you love to do okay yep and then over the next month tick one off Ah. every day week yes. month whatever but start ticking those things off your list because during lockdown we feel like everything that we love has been taken away from us yes but there's so many there's so many valuable quality uh less uh, expensive less time consuming um, less exorbitant things, you know, yes. really, really simple things in our lives that we love yes. to do that yes. we don't make the time to do it because we don't give ourselves permission to do it or we don't, you know, we make excuses as to why we can't do it or we actually even haven't thought about what is it that I love to do because I've got to yes. focus on this individual and this task and doing that. But the yes. more you do something for, so for somebody else, yes, the more you're depleting of yourself. Yes. So for you to show up as your best, what do you need to do for yourself to ensure mm. that you can? Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying every day you're going to have the ability to do that, but what I am saying is only you can give yourself permission to mm. write that list and give yourself the time to do it. Yes. So for nurses, for example, they're, they're in, they're, I mean, the, the time frames that they have to work, it's just unacceptable. They're not paid mm -hmm. enough. They're not, they don't have enough support. They've got way too many expectations on them. These oh. people, teachers, nurses, paramedics, firefighters, mm. All these frontline workers, mm -hmm. they need some time to do to to reboot themselves. They need some time to sure. to digest and regenerate. And yes, and no one can give them that time other than them. So yes. start by writing down a list. One of my girlfriends did this. Yes, and during lockdown, if she had a birthday, she yes. couldn't go out. You know, couldn't do anything. Yeah, you know, <laughs> she decided to get her top 10 list and she ticked off all of those items on her birthday she said it was one of the best oh. birthdays she's ever had oh. that's that amazing simple things like walk barefoot in the grass yes. go and bake your favorite cookies yes give your best friend a call like yes just, you know, yes little it just yeah it takes time out to sit and think and, and reflect you are reminding me of two years ago my Christmas present to the family was to, I wrote a list of something we would do every single month. So we had a family activity and it was going and floating in a lake in Victoria that wraps around circular. So you'd come back to the same spot. Like it was going for a bushwalk. Like it was pretty simple things. It didn't cost a lot of money, but it actually was a, a way for everyone to come together and have something to look forward to. And it was the best gift except that COVID happened <laughs> we couldn't do a lot of it yeah. um so you've reminded me I'm going to re reinvent that so and I think that activity of actually sitting down and reflecting on what's important and what you'd like to to do or achieve yeah it does make a difference so yep. yeah you write it down you're 40 percent more likely to achieve it to do it yes true um I have one other very important question for you how are you going to celebrate your 50th next year 
Well, that all depends on all the rules and health regulations. <laughs> <laughs> I have all sorts of ideas, but I might end up just hosting a few people at home. <laughs> depends <laughs> on, on how things go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but either way, I'm going to celebrate it. I love my birthday. I celebrate every birthday. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah, I, I love getting older because with age comes wisdom. And with wisdom comes empathy and with empathy mm -hmm. comes stronger connections. Mm -hmm. So even though my friendship group is getting smaller, the bond with them is getting stronger. Stronger, so, yeah. yeah. I really love birthdays and I love celebrating <laughs> them. And, um, That's great. Yeah, that way you remember them. Yes, <laughs> correct. And you look <laughs> forward to them. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, was there anything else that you wanted to share with us today that we haven't talked about? Oh, goodness. We've covered a lot of grounds, Sonia. We have. Uh, <laughs> You've making been sure wonderful. that we're not overwhelming your audience but um, <laughs> you know, I think I'd love to come back just to the message that's on my t-shirt and that uh, adoptees tend to rely on external or extrinsic circumstances to validate them before they can validate themselves mm -hmm. um, and I remember in the that uh, Steve Jobs film where Steve Wozniak says to Steve Jobs what is it with you adoptees you always think you've been rejected instead of accepted and, <laughs> For those of us that have been very fortunate to being adopted into very loving families, we have literally been accepted. Yes. Yes. Right? We yes. have been brought into love and family and belonging and connection and acceptance. And we look, we may not be of blood relation, but we have heart relation. We're a bond. Yes. Much stronger so than true. Life. And so I when I start to sabotage that relationship with family, mm -hmm. I have to remind myself that it's the story I'm telling myself that's preventing me from creating the connection. Mm -hmm. And the story is usually anchored in judgment and fear. Mm -hmm. And I have to call myself on it and pull myself up and go, what are the judgments I'm casting? Yes. So because it's my judgment of the other person that's preventing me from connecting with them. Yes. And I had that relationship with my biological mother. She told me aspects around, you know, being conceived through date rape and all these things that I just chose not to believe. Yes. And so therefore, because I chose not to believe in her story, I had to create my own story. And therefore, I didn't want to prove her wrong. I just wanted to be right. Okay. Yes. Yes. And when I recognized that I was, by holding on to this story that was only mine, Mm -hmm. It was anchored in judgment of her. It mm -hmm. prevented me from connecting with her on a meaningful level. Okay. Yes. So I had to actually let go of the judgment. Yes. Let go of the righteousness. Yes. Because my connection with her was way more important to me than being yes. right about my own story. Okay. So what was your story that you had in your mind? My story that was that she was young and promiscuous okay. and that there was no way she was raped and that, of course, she could remember my father's name. Who doesn't remember, you know, the person oh, wow. yes. they're falling pregnant to? And, um, and she never really wanted me. She was too young to keep me. Yeah, sure, her parents told her, yeah, you must give it away. And, you know, she fought for having me. But, you know, yes. I said, yeah, right, as if. Um, yes. That, yeah. That's all judgment, 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 which means pushing, 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 which means yeah. validation, validation, validation. Yeah. You yeah. know what? You've hit the nail on the head for me that we've just been talking lately about um, advantaged thinking and how we start to bring more of that into what we do, that it's not always about what happened to you. You know, it's actually about what you just said was you're accepted. So let's focus on the acceptance and how we, you know, move forward from, from that mindset as opposed to you're rejected and how do we, how do we fix things? How exactly. Do we, it all yeah. comes back to this. I've been accepted, therefore I am enough. I am enough. I yes. am enough. Yes. Because every one of us is enough, exactly yes. how we are. Nothing's, nothing's broken, nothing needs fixing. Yes. We just need to accept because acceptance ends all suffering. Yes. So if you can accept that you are enough, then you're coming from a place or a foundation of love and acceptance, which is yes. then a it's it's a stepping stone. Yes. To yes. much greater things. Yes. But if you're coming from a fear-based state of rejection and abandonment, and therefore not enoughness and worthlessness, then you would turn into what I became, which is a compassionateless tiger shark 
that basically <laughs> beat everything in front of it and let it bleed out. Because if you're not with me, get the hell out of my way. I want to <laughs> Move out the way. <laughs> Win at all costs. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Thank you so much for all your time and all your insights. And it, it sounds like you have an amazing program with your Awake uh, program. Yeah. So uh, I think our families will benefit so much from what you've had to say. So so thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, if, if uh, any parents are struggling with the conversations with their children around adoption, mm -hmm. I, from my experience, please just be honest with them from the start. Let mm. them let them be curious let them know because then that will build that connection with your child knowing that they're that they are loved and accepted irrespective of where they've come from or the yes. path they've traveled to be where they are yes. and that it's safe for them to explore that aspect of themselves yes and uh and if they choose to do that is of no reflection on you yes yes exactly. and if anything it's a it's a positive reflection because you've given you've empowered them to to feel the safety to do that yes so yeah. yeah i just wish my dad was more honest with me earlier on because earlier by the time on. i'm five my brain yes. has changed i can now judge analyze and criticize up until that point i'm just a narcissist yes so. oh, it must have come as such a shock yeah it was yeah Big yeah I turned into Alice. And so you hadn't been, I mean, you're kind of at that age where you might have started to kind of look around and go, I look a bit different or, you know, but yeah. you hadn't well, been through that sort of, no. I never had reason to. Mm. Yeah, you were probably a bit young for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then all the kids around the school and friends around the street started asking questions. It's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I belong here, don't I? <laughs> so, well yeah it's a good thing that you're not questioning that so yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. that's what you got out of not being told early well, on the thing is is that as I would have had I been told I I would have been able to silence the questioning yes I just say yeah I was adopted yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> there's the answer yeah, yeah. True. Why do you look so different? Where do you get you come from? What's stalk? You know, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh, now I do. I was adopted. Yeah. <laughs> I know what that feels like. Um, because we had a we've got a couple of African girls in our, our lives. So yeah. clearly I probably look a little bit different too. <laughs> clearly. I mean you could um, be from Africa. <laughs> don't look like I come from Africa. Um and so we would sometimes even walk into a restaurant. So um, two white children, two brown children, and people would just look at us with their mouths open. Like <laughs> sometimes, it, you know, it was just so obvious that people were in, in shock. So yeah. um, it's How a tough gig to feel? walk into. So How do you feel when that happens? For me, I was fine. I was like, let's just charge on in. <laughs> really? But I'm not the... You always like that? I'm not the the African child in a very white world, so. But how do um, they feel about it when they see that? Oh, uh, they wore hoodies a lot. Yeah, they so they would them hide them. into themselves, and you know, and we'd we'd talk about it, and um, we'd make jokes around things so that their skin was a bit thicker, perhaps, as they went out into the world. Um, but at the end of the day, they had to live and breathe that environment. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. So. I, think from, I was saying this to my, because I stay in touch with my half sister who lives in America, my mother's daughter, and uh, we were talking yesterday and she was telling me how, you know, some people call her weird and things like that. And I said, yes, the way that when people want to bring you down or when people give you a hard time or judge you and criticize you, it's an opportunity for you to ask yourself, what does that say about them? Them. Because You're so right because it's not about you it's no. just you know what it's just triggered a story thought feeling and they don't have the filter yes <laughs> the monitor, how they're responding to so that shut feeling. their mouth yeah. <laughs> correct just so, pick up your chin a little bit yeah. so what does that say about them and in the event that it's it's inexplicable or it's unacceptable Mm -hmm. then if you can stay detached from the judgment that they are projecting onto you yes therefore you don't take on the judgment 
Yes. And that gives you the empowerment and also the empathy to go back to them and say, has something I've done upset you? Yes. Or what's given you reason to say what you've just said or behave in a way that you've just behaved? Yes. Because they need a, like you are a mirror to them. Yes. We are all mirrors to each other. Yes. But sometimes the mirror needs to speak. <laughs> I think if I would have spoken, yeah. but that's it because would have done more damage, perhaps. It's better to just sometimes to... example, be an example. Sorry, I cut you off. No, it's because you were going to speak from judgment and fear. You weren't going to speak from love. Yeah. So if well, you... yeah, um, maybe, yeah. That's that's when we go. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say anything because I was... <laughs> you would have come come out as a lioness. <laughs> yeah it's so, like you know it's that don't make these children feel uncomfortable in this space why would you do that you're an adult surely you can kind of so that's when you have to ask the children did that person's response to you make you feel uncomfortable if so why how yes. did it make you feel uncomfortable yes how would yes. you normally respond to this and how can I equip you to ensure that that behavior which is going to continue to occur yes yes doesn't impact you the same way like what yes, could we do correct correct yeah. Uh, my advice was just smile at people. Smile yeah. at people. You've got the best white teeth going around. Yeah. <laughs> Show those pearly whites. Exactly. And people can't not help but smile back when you smile at them. So, exactly. yeah. yeah. But so. Love always um, silences fear. Yes, true. Love so. conquers fear. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Hmm. All right, well, I'm going away with a new mantra today of I am enough and I'm oh, going to, to Make sure my children know that they are enough and hopefully um, our families will learn from you as well that they are enough. So I trust that will be so the case. Thank you for giving up your time today to share sure. with us. It's been amazing and it will be a, of great value to our families. My pleasure. Thank you, Sonia. And if 